a call to the member for Fremantle. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to speak to the motion, and I, I thank the member for Fairfax for bringing it. There's, look, there's no argument that trade's vital to Australia. We're a, we're a trading nation, and it's core to our economic well-being. It plays an important role in our global and regional engagement. Um, fair and free trade is in our national interest. It's consistent with our values, and done well, it should be a tide that lifts all boats. It's widely acknowledged that trade has a key role to play in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. That's why Australian Labor has always favoured the pursuit of multilateral arrangements rather than being uh, content with the endless ring a ring a rosy of bilateral preferential trade agreements. Um, but in any case, members should not approach the shaping of Australia's trade future by declaring some kind of blanket support in advance of any particular agreement. That would be a failure of our responsibility as parliamentarians. The last thing we need. Uh, is mindless cheerleading in relation to matters that are as important and complicated as trade. Deputy Speaker, it was a privilege to be a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties in the 45th Parliament and to consider trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the PACER Plus and the Peru-Australia Free Trade Agreements. In the course of those inquiries, the J. Scott heard from business, industry, agricultural and civil society stakeholders who called for closer involvement uh, in trade negotiations, as happens in other countries. They call for better information about the opportunities provided by new trade arrangements, especially for small and medium businesses, with more resources to facilitate their participation in trade. There was also a strong consensus from trade experts in favour of independent analysis and modelling of trade agreements, their impacts and benefits. Indeed, three separate reports from the J. Scott recommended to government that it adopt the practice of commissioning such independent analysis. So far, the government keeps refusing to do so. On all these matters, there is room for Australia to do trade agreements much better. And on that basis, I'd call on members to support these kinds of improvements so that we get higher quality trade agreements and a better place to assess them, which is our job. Deputy Speaker, when it comes to specific trade agreements, I hope it's not deeply shocking to observe that some are not as good as they could be. All of them include provisions that might have been stronger. Many of them nowadays include provisions that probably shouldn't be there at all. And that's not least because these days such agreements are not just about trade, but also about investment rules, intellectual property and even labour market access arrangements. Not all countries take that approach. The United States, for example, does not make foreign labour access concessions through trade agreements. These other matters have nothing to do with tariffs and quotas, and they do raise legitimate issues of concern. Under the original TPP, Australia had agreed to provide an effective extension of the monopoly rights for biologic medicines from five to eight years. That could have cost the pharmaceutical benefits scheme hundreds of millions of dollars. There's also broad concern in the Australian community about investor state dispute settlement provisions, or ISDS, clauses that give foreign companies the right to take action against governments through international tribunals of dubious integrity. Tobacco company Philip Morris used an ISDS in an investment treaty between Australia and Hong Kong to sue our government over plain packaging reforms. That legal action cost Australian taxpayers tens of millions of dollars. It only failed because of a jurisdictional issue, and if not for that technicality, Philip Morris may well have interfered with one of the most important public health reforms of recent times. As it was, New Zealand didn't proceed with their own plain packaging laws for three years while awaiting the outcome of the Philip Morris case. In other countries, there have been successful challenges against environmental laws and workplace laws. ISDS has become a mechanism by which multinationals protect their profits by interfering in the sovereign capacity to govern and make policy for the public good. That's why Labor doesn't support the inclusion of ISDS in trade agreements, and this government shouldn't either. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the motion does refer to jobs. Um, trade agreements don't automatically produce jobs. Uh, in a relatively high-wage developed economy like ours, trade can deliver economic growth while still causing jobs to shift elsewhere. Members might reflect on the analysis commissioned by the World Bank on the original TPP, which estimated Australia would lose 38,000 full-time jobs. Uh, they should also remember that this government's been using trade agreements to weaken our temporary foreign labour arrangements. Uh, allowing contractual service providers to bypass labour market testing provisions. So, Speaker, no one in this place should rush to become a cheerleader in advance of 
trade agreements. Members would do well to consider the non-trade aspects of recent agreements and ask themselves whether they're really in the national interest.